Okay, so the presentation is uh, entitled Labor Market Structures and Pay Gap in the Philippines and Occupational Skills-Based Characterization. So it's a bit of a technical paper in terms of nature, but then we tried our best to, to focus or to apply um, a methodology that would allow us to identify the role of skills-based uh, specificity and uh, highlight the distance measure in the analysis of uh, occupations. Okay, so we all know, all of us who are here are quite familiar with a mega trend and that is coming from technological advances. And the implications are quite clear. The world of work that we previously know before is rapidly evolving. And uh, the reason why um, a lot of agencies are trying to come up with these strategies is that we all believe in the primacy of skills development. And we all know that having poor national skills profile hurt the economy and it reduces the complementarities between skills and the great job mobility and wage growth. And we aspire to achieve better outcomes. And um, most of us think that having a more strategic skills development framework would allow us to reduce poverty and increase productivity, and more importantly, be given the opportunity to reduce labor market frictions in the form of uh, mismatches in terms of skills. So the main advocacy of this paper is to focus on occupational skills to highlight two measures, distance and then occupational skills specificity in occupations. And uh, we believe that this is just one of the several ways through which we can better characterize labor markets uh, in the Philippines. Um, so we did a quick survey of the literature. And of course, if you're talking about skills, talking about jobs, occupations, and other labor market outcomes, we have to pay homage to the to human capital theory. And in, in the literature, of course, we are aware that uh, there is a role uh, for skills durable investments. And these are acquired through school attendance or be involved in job training. And uh, among employers, of course, and even employees, there's this acknowledgement that investing too much in specific skills may not be a good idea at all. But, you know, we have to acknowledge but that by investing in specific skills, we may generate higher returns. It's because we're the only ones who can do the perform some of the tasks that are quite complex. And because of this, we become more productive and as a result, better rewarded in the workplace. But by investing in specific skills, we also um, become more specialized and that introduces inflexibility. So remember, we have the skills and the skills are portable when we move from one job to another. And the problem there is that, you know, we, we would like to go to another job that shares some of the similarities in terms of the skill requirements um, in the in our present job. Okay, so uh, we all know in the, well, even without referring to the literature, for workers to produce output, they need to accomplish tasks using skills relevant to the occupation. And in the literature, uh, although there are a lot of tasks associated with each of the occupations listed in the labor force survey, there's this acknowledgement that what we're dealing with are low dimensional vectors of skill, okay? So, and that's the reason why it's, it becomes very difficult to map uh, tasks to skills or to identify competencies without a formal framework embodied in a survey. And uh, it's becoming clear that in the literature, there's this uh, shying away from uh, human capital. So why? Because the task approach is, uh, uh, emerging as a dominant strategy to classify jobs. And this one prioritizes 
task content and skills requirements. So it's no longer enough to say that, okay, I graduated from college and I'm already a skilled worker. It's not going to happen because in the first place, the degree, list, for instance, economics, it can be classified as skill. It's considered a general skill. It's not a specific skill. And uh, why is that? It's because skills, general skills, are going to be reweighted within firms. So we have general skills. And then when we go to a firm, they offer us jobs designed in such a way to maximize the skills that we possess. But then there's reweighting in the sense that it's not possible for a firm to simply focus on a particular skill. And then that particular skill receives 100% weight. It's not That's not simply possible. So that's the relevance of um, skills in this particular context. And we all know uh, that... Uh, you know, there's a general scheme for classifying occupations based on non-routine analytic, non-routine interactive, etc. And these are ways to which we're able to identify which jobs are really in danger of being affected by automation and then AI. Okay. So uh, based on last year, and then we now we individual skills are general skills but may become specific to occupations once different skills have been combined and weighted within firms. Well, Becker is of the opinion that general skills are supposed to be applicable across firms. And then if you have specific skills, then it means that once you leave the firm that you are or that you have originally engaged with, well, you're going to lose relevance, okay, in terms of skills that you possess. It's because it was assumed that the skills are supposed to be only relevant within the firm. So if you move away from the firm, then you have to retool, you have to relearn. Okay, and another central concept uh, when it comes to this literature is the distance. So people tend to shift or to move to another occupation that shares some similarities in terms of skill requirements with the previous job that they have. So the skills do not depreciate contrary to what Becker uh, initially believed. They do not depreciate in the sense that if the occupations have similar structures, then it means that the worker okay, can still benefit from his experiences in the past. And uh, the best example is provided by Gottman and Schoenberg. So in the interest of time, I will just focus on, the, on one direction. So... The carpenter is better off becoming or transitioning as a cabinet maker than becoming a baker. Okay, it's because there are some skills that are similar across occupations. And for the baker, it's not a good idea for the baker to become a carpenter. It's because they are these are occupations that may be a bit far from each other. But of course, we end up. That's what the skills development, development programs are for, to at least uh, be able to assess the distance between the occupations and to offer a training program in order to mitigate or reduce the costs associated with job transitions. So specificity, specificity and distance can be used to characterize the labor market. Uh, I'll show you that later. And uh, it's it, they can be used. Uh, after all, these are measures that we can integrate in our uh, programs, in our frameworks. And uh, in the literature, the distance between two occupations can explain wage gains or losses in the event of job transitions. Okay. So there are uh, well-accepted methods to organize skills data, uh, but based on our assessment, uh, no skills data are collected in any of the nationally representative surveys that contain the PSOC codes. So this, uh, the PSOC is the Philippine Standard Occupational Code Classification Codes. Okay, so there are two methods. One is the direct method, and we are fortunate if we have ratings data to characterize the complexity of occupations. The other one is the indirect method, which uses factor analysis to extract information from the raw data of tasks. So we can actually carry this out. We carried it out, but then we will. I will share with you some of the problems that we've encountered. So we used the indirect method, and we were able to ex extract the tasks enumerated 
uh, in the PSOC code. So there are a lot of tasks and then they vary across occupations. So we applied factor analysis and then proceeded to extract the task. So it became problematic because there are too many identified factors. And these are latent factors, by the way. And factor analysis will allow you to identify or measure these latent factors. And then when it comes to classification, um, you know, tasks under each retained factors appear sensible. Okay, so we you have tending, storing, delivering, raising, harvesting, planting, cultivating, so forth and so on. And we are going to assign, okay, if you're the researcher, you're going to assign this uh, under uh, a factor. In this case, it's factor two. So how are you going to interpret factor two? What, what kind of... Uh, description is appropriate. And then there's this mapping challenge. So there's this challenge of mapping these 60 factors into broad types of skills. Again, it's uh, it involves complex operation. And then we also have to deal with attrition in addition. So there are 10% 10, 10 of the occupations did not have under its list any of the 233 tasks. Okay, so uh, it's difficult to implement the procedure. So in the absence of skills data in nationally representative surveys, we opted to adopt a crosswalk strategy. Now what this what this one is telling us is that we try to use the occupational information network database. And then based on the database, we were able to identify job tasks, skills, and other information. And the reason for this is, as I mentioned, we don't have available skills data in nationally representative surveys. Okay, so we use the ONET database in order to generate skills data. And the level, the unit of observation, of course, is the occupation. So there are 35 skills descriptors um, in the ONET database. So essentially, if you have uh, th let's consider the occupation dentist, okay? So the dentist in the Philippines, um, you know, require, being a dentist requires special skills, right? So there's also a dentist in the U.S. because the only database is based on uh, the labor market in the U.S., labor market information system, essentially. So we, how do you identify the skills for a dentist in the Philippines. And my our argument is that it may be possible to refer to what the skills and competencies are for the dentist using the ONET database, okay? Okay. So, uh, and then, yeah, so that's what we did. So we were able to come up with this, implement the cross-walking strategy using the 2015 CPH PSOC codes. And we were able to reconcile. So as a matter of fact, uh, these are the pertinent statistics that are associated with the crosswalking exercises. Okay. So the so we can use the we can use factor analysis in order to uh, try to map tasks to skills, but then it's going to be difficult. So this is one of the several ways through which we can appeal to, or we can gather uh, skills data. Okay. And then we measured uh, occupational specificity. Um, in the on a database, there is this importance data. Okay, essentially they ask uh, analysts, okay, which of the skills are important for this job? Okay, some, an information like that is critical for us to carry out the computations associated with the specificity measure. Okay, so uh, for instance, in, in this particular case, occupations one and two use active listening, coordination, monitoring, and then suppose there's a fourth skill, which is management in skills in occupation one. So we proceeded to compute it this way. Okay, so the specificity, so these are, we utilize the, the data on ranks. So we just have to compute it as follows, following this, uh, this general formula. And then we're able to identify um, the degree of skills specificity in occupations. 
And then, uh, for instance, if you are talking about building structure cleaners, the specificity measure is very low. It's because, um, you know, because of the weight, weighting done by firms. So the general skills that these uh, workers are supposed to possess are not really that valued in the uh, by the firm in terms of arriving at the at the the weights. But then, if you're talking about electronics engineers, the specific specificity measure is is uh, one. Okay, so and then what we did was to map the 35 skills identified in the onnet in order to form a broader set of of uh, skills, and these are expressed in terms of groups, five groups: social, basic, analytical, management, mechanical, and mechanical skills. Okay, so. So, and then we measure distance using the simple Euclidean measured idea is that if you already have data on the skills, it may be possible for you now to determine how dissimilar occupations are in terms of the skills requirements. So again, the um, it's not going to be easy if you're going to, to rely on the indirect route that is to compute for or identify factors. And some of the uh, results are are found in this uh, table. So, for instance, we look at the occupations with employment of at least uh, one percent, and uh, try to relate it to, um, and then figure out the percent of employment to relative to total working population. This is quite high, but then the average specificity for these occupations belonging uh, to this twenty five. Uh, is quite low. So it may already reflect us. Um, so we can, in fact, characterize what's happening to our labor market using this specificity measure. And uh, so um, based on the results that we were able to generate, we found that the NCR has the highest proportion of workers involved in occupations that use the social, fundamental, analytical, and management skills more intensively. And then uh, Calabarzon is the greatest number of workers involved in occupations that use mechanical skills. And then uh, in terms of uh, gender, uh, we found that 50% uh, of uh, males um, possess uh, basic skills. And then when it comes to, um, to higher ordered uh, skills, uh, you have 16% of males versus 40% of uh, females. Okay. So it, you know, you also have this uh, geographical distribution of the skills that can be properly accounted for by using the methodology. Now, uh, usually we, the, the Department of Labor and Employment identifies in-demand jobs and then uh, hard to fill jobs. And as mentioned by Dr. Ballesters, there are jobs that remain unfilled, meaning these are advertised in order to entice applicants. But then uh, they remain unfilled. And then uh, what's worse is that there are still uh, a number of Filipinos uh, that are unemployed. So meaning there's that's uh, essentially the result of um, poor uh, matches in the labor market. Okay, so based on our analysis, in-demand jobs are mostly in agribusiness, host hotel, restaurant, tourism, construction, health and wellness, wholesale and retail trade, and then IT, BPM, and manufacturing. So again, you talk about firms that are operating within each of these industries, and it's the firms that will try to determine the weights associated, that way may be relevant uh, for them, for their workers to perform the task, no? Uh, and then there are hard to fill jobs and these jobs, they do require specific skills. So this is one of the justifications why um, the skill, the specificity measure may be um, or should be computed. And then the average social basic manage and management skills are relatively similar to those of in-demand jobs. The average mechanical skills are lower 
while well, the analytical skills are substantially higher. Okay, so there are other details that I that we can go back to during the Q and A session. Now, the the paper also um, was able to um, characterize the gender pay gap, and of course, the you know it it depends on the 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 data that was used, and uh, based on the twenty fifteen LFS, uh, the mean daily pay of female workers is higher relative to the males. And this was in 2015. So what we did uh, was to specify Minsurian regression models that incorporate the skills and then perform that decomposition of the wage gap. And again, this is one of the benefits of being able to gather skills data. It's because it will also allow you to characterize wage outcomes. Okay, so the, the results indicate that uh, for females, okay, um, it pays to have good social skills, analytical, management, um, and management skills. Uh, what does this mean? It means that if it exceeds, if the measure or the estimate exceeds one, then it means that it's actually an attribute that can reduce the wage gap. So uh, as a counterfactual exercise, for instance, we may think of her, um, replicating, let's say, the performance of female students or female workers in terms of um, being able to accumulate or uh, achieve uh, competencies that promote social skills, something like that, or analytical skills. So that's one of the uh, uh, plausible applications of the methodology that was developed. So uh, I will just highlight that the, the labor market structures play a role in reducing the, the pay gap. So it's always important to pay attention to factors that, let's say, promote labor force participation, that promote or enhance the universality of access to uh, skills development and training programs, etc. So let me now go to the takeaways. I just have three, three minutes uh, before wrapping up the presentation. Uh, well, I think the, based on the results, we really have to reinvigorate our basic education sector. It's because how can we claim to um, address skills required for advancing manufacturing, for dealing with AI, for dealing with machine learning, if our students are not able to develop competencies in reading, in mathematics and science. So I, uh, I'm of the opinion that we really need to uh, improve uh, our basic educational system for our students to develop clear uh, competencies in subjects that we need to advance, let's say manufacturing and industry. Um, well, we cannot overemphasize the importance of tertiary education, okay? And uh, I think, uh, well, it, it wasn't measured, but then lifelong learning is, is definitely one of the key competencies that our educational institutions should focus on. And not only that, um, in industry, there must be a deliberate uh, effort, okay, to promote lifelong learning because it doesn't only happen in universities or schools. And then uh, Tibet plays a big role, of course, uh, in tackling in demand and hard to fill job situations. So there's also a need to assess the quality of jobs being created by the expanding sectors. Okay, so I think uh, because we need rescaling and upskilling programs. And uh, well, we have to pay close attention to uh, uh, a problem uh, that's very persistent. So we need to encourage women to participate in the labor market considering uh, the, the results that was shown earlier in the regressions. Um, there are a lot of issues here, and I don't think I have the, the time to really focus on 
each of them. And we need to leverage women's better educational achievements, okay, um, in order to mitigate the skills gap in highly technical occupations. So again, um, that's what this study is for, to identify the degree of skills specificity in occupations. It's because nowadays what we really would like to emphasize is that occupations um, rely on specific skills, okay? So the, and then the, this is a part of our wish list, um, best practices for collecting, analyzing, and updating labor market information um, should be um, integrated in the in our statistical systems. Okay, so I think that's it. Uh, thank, thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to listening to your comments and answering your questions.